Athletics Association. We welcome you. Uh, we have our West Bengal Orthopedics Association's president, Dr. Kanchan Vachasar, and we have our uh, our ortho pedic club president, Dr. Jagannath Vachasar. So, Sir Jagannath Vachasar, please start the session with your welcome note. Can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Good evening. Good yes. evening, everybody. Thank you. Good. And uh, welcome to the viewers and listeners from our state, from our country all parts of our country and also from abroad, if any. So welcoming you for this grand session. I think it will be a very nice session by Professor Shashkar Uzdash. And he will deliver a very good lecture on different aspects of proximal tibial fractures. I welcome our moderators, Dr. Rajiv Chattopadhyay and Dr. Chetan Pradhan. Also, I welcome my beloved Kantan Bhattacharjo, WBA president, and also for Dr. Partho Sharkar, WBA secretary, and also the other the fellows who will also listen to this program. And I think this will be a very nice session. In my 42 years of orthopedic life, I always I'm always a learner. I want to learn something from Professor Shaskar. Professor John Joseph Shaskar is from I think from Canada and and the, his uh, Shashka's classification was published in 1979. We all know about that. Some of us know about that. And I think we always follow the Shashka's classification in managing the tibial plate to fractures. And we'll all be benefited by this, even though the topics are unique. And I think everybody will have a very nice session with Professor Shashka and a pleasant session also. Thank you very much and enjoy the session. Thank you, sir. I request our uh, beloved Kanchan Bhatcha, sir, WBO president, please uh, give some input. A warm welcome to Professor Shatsker. We grew up studying his work on proximal tibia and there have been so many years after that but his classification and his teachings have remained unchanged. This also gives me a chance to pay my respects to my old mentor, Dr. Jagannath Bhattacharya, whom we just heard, and my note of appreciation to Obhijit and Shubro and the Hara Orthopedic Club for organizing such a wonderful meeting. I'm sure Rajiv and Chetan will carry this forward. And without much ado, I want the talks to go on and for us to enjoy and learn a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, before I uh, transfer the mic to uh, Rajiv, beloved Rajiv Chatterjee, sir, and Chetan Pradhan, sir, I just uh, share some uh, things about Professor Skashkar. Uh, so I just uh, go through that after. Uh, Yeah, so here is the little biography of uh, Professor Skachkar. Basically, he born in 8 September 1934. Uh, he did his MD University of Toronto in the 1960, then BSc Medicine in 1962 from University of Toronto, then 1966 Fellow of Royal College of Surgeons of Canada, then again 1967 Duncan Fellow of Professor Dewar University of Toronto, in the very next year, he did uh, in the 1968 McLaughlin Fellowship in Europe, that is Sweden, Sweden and Switzerland. After that, in 1969, the orthopedic surgeon at the University of Toronto. In 1971, he was the member of AO. And 1985, began work at Sunny Book Hospital, the largest trauma center in Canada. In 1998, he selected as a president of AO Foundation and Professor Emirates, Emirates of Orthopedic Surgery in the University of Toronto. In 2007, member of Order of Canada, 
and in 2018 director of Muller Institute of Sunny Book Toronto, Canada, and still operate as orthopedic surgeon till today. So uh, here is some uh, short bibliography. Professor Scratchker hold 28 visiting professorship, including China and Australia, and is one of the editorial review board of JBGS and Journal of Orthopedics and Trauma Surgery. He is known internationally for his skill in orthopedic fracture and trauma care and still work as an orthopedic surgeon today. Uh, it is really our uh, it is really our great pleasure to welcome Professor Joe Skatchkar to the city of joy, Kolkata, India. Thank you. So now I uh, handed over the whole things to Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee and Dr. Chetan Podhan, sir. Please carry forward. Okay, so a uh, very good evening to everyone. I think just you can keep on talking about Professor Joe Shaska, you'll never end. And such a humble man. I mean, you know, when met him in China and just, he just explained things so simply to us. I mean, I'm in, we have been indebted to him for his understanding of the proximal tibia that today, even today, Shaska's classification still stands. And of course, he's modified with the Kupi's modification. Uh, and he's been sort of, you know, he's been taking the whole thing forward. So when he realized something more needed to be added on, he added on to the, to the classification. And I think I just leave the stage to him. He is such a wonderful speaker. And he'll, he'll be a mesmerizing next one hour, I can tell you. I've heard him before twice, and I was mesmerized. We couldn't move. I remember Chengdu, half an hour, nobody moved. I don't know if I breathed those half an hour. So I, with that, I hand over to you, Professor Shaska. We look forward to you, sir. The stage is all yours. Thank you. Shall we now begin? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, sir. You cannot? No. no, not yet. Okay, then allow me. No problem. Yep, it's coming on. Can you see that? You can see a white. I can see your mouse. I can see a white screen, and your mouse, you know, your tracker mouse is moving on the screen. Yes. Able to see this? Um, still the white screen with the yeah. tracker mouse. The arrow is moving. You're not seeing the presentation? No. The slide hasn't come out on yet. Yes, yep. can you see yep. that? Yeah, we can see it. It starts with today. Yeah, that's one. Very good. Perfect. Then we will proceed. Yes, sir. Good evening, gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to join your meeting. And I wish to thank you for the opportunity of allowing me to make presentations. I think this is the wonderful opportunity that Zoom uh, has offered. We are able to participate on an international level, each of us staying at home and benefiting from uh, this opportunity. Today, I wish to bring to your attention the most up-to-date information on the current principles guiding operative treatment of intraarticular fracture. 
just to put things in their perspective before you can fully understand the message which i wish to share with you um, I, I i must put things in a historical perspective allow me just one moment i must change the screen so that i can see things clearly Prior to 1960, prior to the rise of the Swiss AO, all closed fractures were treated closed. Fractures were treated either in a cast or in traction. An intra-articular fracture of a major weight-bearing joint like the knee meant months in traction and then outcome was the lifelong invalidity. Let me illustrate with this example. This was a highly placed politician, a man of 48 years, who fell and sustained a fracture of the proximal tibia. He was treated in traction, and at six months, we can see the outcome of conservative treatment a deformed limb and a stiff joint. This is what we are trying to avoid. Already in 1950, John Charnley, in his famous book on the close treatment of fractures stated that intra-articular fractures could only be treated successfully by open reduction and in internal fixation. Sir John Charnley was a visionary, but in the days he practiced, the methods were inadequate and surgery often meant the worst of both worlds. The illustration which I'm showing to you is from a publication by Stewart in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, 1967. This was the state of the art The rise of the Swiss AO methods in the 1950s and 1960s developed methods of anatomic reduction and absolutely stable fixation, which made fracture surgery safe and successful. The AO principles, philosophy and methods revolutionized the surgical world. Operative treatment, particularly of major intra-articular fractures, became the standard of care. However, the early years were not without mistakes. We taught in 1960 immediate surgery. The principles which you see below this highlighted message have remained the same, but I wish to speak to you now on the issues of immediate surgery. These were the errors of the first 20 years of the AO school, the indiscriminate early surgery on all articular fractures led to an incidence of soft tissue complications, something we did not appreciate. We taught that the earlier you intervene, the more likely you are going to prevent complications. We focused on bone and believed that it was the dead bone which caused infection. Literature warned about plating of articular fractures. In those days we spoke, or the critics spoke of a dead bone sandwich. All of us failed to recognize the indications and implications of major trauma. 
namely the injury to the soft tissue envelope. This is the most important thing to recognize, that energy delivered to a limb, and we must differentiate the degree of energy between low and high energy fractures, because it is essential to recognize the implications of energy when it comes to treatment and methods of fixation. I'm going to use the classification which I proposed in 1974 for fractures of the proximal tibia. And the fractures, the intraarticular fractures, I classified into six principal types. And we have fractures and fracture dislocations. And it is terribly important to recognize the difference between the two. In the low velocity injury, where the quantum of energy is low, the soft tissue envelope is able to withstand an early surgical intervention. Without the complications, of wound breakdown and soft tissue necrosis. So it is essential to differentiate between low energy and a high energy injury. The types four, five, and six are not only intra-articular fractures, but they are intra-articular fractures associated with dislocations of the joint or instability of the joint to the point of being partial dislocations or have the potential of great instability. However, I don't wish to dwell now on joint stability as much as on the soft tissue envelope damage that occurs in a high velocity injury or high energy injury. The concept which I often refer to is that a fracture is a soft tissue injury with a broken bone inside. Because it is really the soft tissue envelope that will determine the history uh, of what might follow. If we intervene the wrong way and cause soft tissue necrosis, we cause a disaster which greatly compromises the success of treatment. Here we see a high velocity injury on the day of admission to hospital. And this is the same limb eight days later, and we see the degree of damage to the soft tissue envelope. And to have operated early with such severe compromise of the soft tissue envelope is to invite then wound breakdown, wound necrosis, secondary bone infection, and a disaster. The message which I would like to leave with you, that the only emergencies that we have to deal with immediately, definitively, are open fractures. Those which are threatening the overlying skin due to the deformity, a sharp piece of bone compromising the overlying skin, or compartment syndromes or vascular and or neurological complications or absolutely irreducible fracture dislocation that doesn't budge no matter how much traction 
we apply. I would like to speak now on more specific issues which guide, which are the guiding principles and the rationale for treatment of intraarticular fractures. Friedrich Pauls was a famous German surgeon who is really the father of biomechanics. I had the great privilege to meet Professor Powell's at his home in 1967. And it was the first time that I heard his concepts of what uh, a joint injury represents. Powell's in 1967 considered articular cartilage as a living tissue, something few recognized. And he taught that in a joint, there is a homeostasis, a balance between articular cartilage destruction from wear and tear and articular cartilage regeneration. And for articular cartilage regeneration, we require living biological tissue. So with this concept in mind, uh, he put forth that an anatomic reduction of an articular surface not only restores the maximum possible surface area, but this lowers stress. We must also correct the axial deformity to prevent stress from overload. Why is reduction of stress so important? The reduction of stress is important because it allows the healing of the articular cartilage surface, shattered by or damaged by trauma. But when we open up early an interarticular fracture, the damage to the articular cartilage is not visible to the naked eye. We can see the deformity, we can see the fracture, but not its implications. A colleague of mine, a Canadian by the name of Nelson Mitchell, who worked at McGill University in the early 1980s, studied the accuracy of reduction, the influence of the accuracy of reduction and stability of fixation on articular cartilage healing and regeneration. He carried out a very elegant experiment using the rabbit's knee as a model. And he carried out an osteotomy of the lateral femoral condyle. He then simply inserted a screw into the broken condyle but did not reduce the fracture, left it unreduced. And at six weeks, we can pretty well see the destruction of the joint. We only see some articular cartilage remaining. The rest is discolored and seriously damaged. After an anatomic reduction, but no stable fixation because the lag screw inserted was not tightened, we see the healing has taken place, but the fracture gap is filled with fibrocartilage. 
when we achieve stability by tightening the lag screw, we have achieved an anatomic reduction, but also absolutely stable fixation. And at six months under the influence of absolutely stable fixation, we see the regeneration of articular cartilage. Histologically and under the electron microscope. So the first thing that we have learned is that articular cartilage as a tissue requires absolute stability in order to be able to heal and regenerate. Linus and Sarmiento studied the accuracy of reduction by designing an ingenious experimental model where they could, by the degree of displacement, study the degree of mal reduction that the joint is able to withstand. And they looked at a negative step, namely a depressed area and a positive step when there is incongruity. And they noticed that in order for articular cartilage to be able to heal, the displacement, in other words, the mal reduction cannot be more than twice the thickness of the articular cartilage at the place of injury. Because we all recognize that the thickness of articular cartilage over a joint varies in thickness. In some areas, the articular cartilage is very thin, in others, it is much thicker. So to say it's a millimeter, it's misleading because it's relative to the thickness of the articular cartilage. And here we see the result of a step of deformity where the step off on your left is no more than once times the thickness of the articular cartilage. We see that healing is taking place. And to the right, where the step off was greater than twice the thickness, we see no healing. We see exposed bone. So we have two things now to keep in mind. When we're dealing with an intraarticular fracture, we should strive for stability and for accuracy of reduction, where the mal reduction is no greater than twice the thickness of the articular cartilage in the zone of injury. We are living today in an era of minimally invasive surgery. There are many advantages, but I would like to focus down on some of the implications that this has on the methods of treatment. And we must look at methods of reduction and their mechanical and biological consequence, namely indirect reduction and direct reduction. And here we see an example. We can see an intraarticular fracture of the proximal tibia treated in traction. 
And what I wish to point out is yes, traction will restore length and may restore alignment, but it does not lead to the reduction of fragments which are impacted and which have lost their soft tissue connection. And on the right, we see the result of an indirect reduction of an articular fracture. Seemingly, it looked reduced. The fracture was fixed. And months later, we see that there are major gaps in the inter in the articular surface because these fragments were not reduced. So there is a lesson which we must learn from this, that articular surface requires to strive for an anatomic reduction, and that can only be achieved by open means, by an open intervention. Closed reduction will not achieve an anatomic reduction of the articular surface. And it is at this point that I would like to bring to your attention the very sharp difference which exists between the articular surface, that is the epiphysis of bone, and the metaphysis and diaphysis. Articular cartilage and long bone have different biological and mechanical principles which guide treatment. And the treatment must reflect these different biological and mechanical principles. So when we're dealing with the joint, the articular cartilage requires a direct intervention, direct reduction in order to achieve an anatomic reduction. And it then behooves us to strive to achieve absolute stability. The metaphysis and the diaphysis, they are long bone. Here, the reduction needs to be functional. In other words, we strive for length, alignment and rotation, but not anatomic reduction. We have seen the difficulties that arise when we try to strive for anatomic reduction, as we did in the early days of the AO for the metaphysis and diaphysis, but that is a subject in itself. We are now dealing with particular fractures, and I simply draw to your attention the great difference, biological and biomechanical, which exists between the articular surface and the metaphysis and diaphysis. Because articular fractures heal rapidly, And then surgical interventions to correct the malreduction have great difficulties and major consequence. We have evolved. The early teaching of the AO was anatomic reduction of the articular surface, followed by to achieve joint congruity followed by metaphyseal reconstruction, correction of the axial deformity, stable fixation, and early motion. Today, when we are dealing with an intraarticular fracture, there has been one difference, and that difference is the emphasis on joint stability. When we achieve an anatomic reduction, we achieve, of course, a stable joint. That simply follows because we are restoring normal anatomy. 
but the question arises, what governs really joint stability? Because we know that it is not possible in every joint to achieve an anatomic reduction. So in our surgical approach, let's dwell on factors governing joint stability, knowing that the most important th thing to achieve when we are treating an intraarticular fracture is a stable situation, because an unstable joint will undergo rapid compromise. We must look first of all on the forces that act on an extremity that produce an injury. And we are dealing with torsion, compression, and shear. And the first thing to recognize is the torsional forces affect the diaphysis and metaphysis. But torsion does not produce articular fractures. Articular fractures are produced by shear and by compression. And the shear results, and here I wish to bring to your attention a concept which is terribly important, namely the concept of the rim of the joint. And the shear, as I will illustrate in the following slides, results in the splitting off of a wedge and the compression results in articular impaction. So we are dealing with two zones that we have to maintain in our mind, namely the rim and the articular surface. Both are important. But when we look at joint stability, the deformity, namely the deviation from anatomic axis due to the metaphyseal deformity and articular depression, that is easily understood, their influence on joint stability. But let me show you now graphically of what message I am trying to deliver. And when you look at the extreme left, you see diagrammatically or schematically proposed and the split off of a wedge by shear. An intraarticular fracture, shear and depression, splits off a wedge. And it is the disruption of the continuity of the rim, which is the cause of joint instability. Joint stability is governed by the continuity of the rim. And what I'm going to be bringing to your attention in the next few slides, that not every articular fracture is the same, that the zone of fracture determines whether it is just a depression or whether the rim has been interrupted in two places by shear, and this has resulted in joint instability. So the first question then that we must examine is how do we look or how do we determine a rim lesion? For many years, we taught to obtain a CT prior to reduction. And I am afraid that this was very much a wrong message because most of the time, 
if you do a CT before you do a provisional reduction by traction, you can't tell which fragment does what. It looks like a bag of bones. So the most important thing is to achieve a provisional reduction by traction. Now we are not achieving an anatomic reduction of the joint as I have brought to your attention. However, traction makes it possible to differentiate what we're dealing with. And namely, we are dealing with two types of rim lesions. One is a split off wedge, which all of us easily recognize. But we then have another lesion to deal with, and that is where the rim is crushed. And the message which I would like to leave with you that a rim crush is really a split off wedge where the width of the wedge is the width of the depression and the tip of the wedge is the floor of the impaction. So there are two rim lesions that we must look for, namely a rim crush and a split off wedge. And the other concept that I would like to leave with you is namely the concept of what is called a principal fracture plane. When you look at an axial cut of a CT of an intraarticular fracture, we recognize the principal plane. Why is this important? How many times have you attempted to convey to someone exactly where to put a buttress plate. This has been a question that has existed for many years. But the message that I would like to leave with you that the correct placement of a buttress plate is absolutely parallel to the principal fracture plane. Why is this important? Because the most important task which we have in deciding definitive fixation is namely a preoperative plan. And the preoperative plan must include the surgical approach. And the surgical approach go together with patient positioning. So when we are looking at an axial cut, we say this is the principal plane. Therefore, my buttress plate has to be parallel to the principal fracture plane. And that will determine the placement, and that will determine the surgical approach, and that will determine the positioning of the patient. So a buttress plate is parallel to the principal fracture plane. The concept which I would like to bring to your attention is the concept that we have what we call a buttress plate and what we tend to call a hoop plate. They are both buttress plates, but if you have a crush, and you wish to contain the crush, you use a plate which you position in such a way that it contains, like the hoop of a barrel, holds the fragments in. These plates are placed on horizontally, whereas the 
buttress plate that we are familiar with is placed along the metaphysis and diaphysis. But the biomechanical function of these two is the same, but one is for a split off wedge and the other, namely the hoop plate is used in a fracture where there is a crush of the rim. But biomechanically, the function is the same. Now, I'm showing you three different intraarticular fractures. One at the very top is a type three, an articular fracture impaction with the rim intact. If you look, the rim remains intact. The fracture involves the articular surface alone. Then we have the rim crush, and then we have the split off wedge. These are the three principal intra-articular injuries that we are dealing with. And we have to recognize the difference because there is a major difference on the stability. The type three, as I mentioned, has an intact rim and unless it involves the whole articular surface, the joint is stable. This zone is covered by a meniscus and it's a pure joint impaction. What is important to recognize the other two, namely the rim crush and the split off wedge, because these two biomechanically determine the joint stability. So the issues that I have raised for you, namely the concept of energy and how important that is. I have also brought for you the concept of a principal fracture plane and the difference in an intra-articular fracture where the rim is intact and an articular fracture where we have either a crush or a split. Finally, the proximal tibia is two columns, a medial and a lateral column. And in dealing surgically, we must remember that we are not dealing only with an injury that involves joint stability, but we must also restore stability. In other words, reconstruct the columns. Because today you recognize that you have plates, locked plates with have angular stability and regular plates. In the regular plate, there is no stability between the screw and the plate itself. And you must provide support for the medial column or a varus malunion will result. So an intra-articular fracture there are two completely different elements that we must consider, namely what to do for the articular surface, how to achieve stability by reconstructing rim continuity. And then also we must support the two columns and this is true of any articular fracture. There is always a medial and lateral column. And for instance, not to confuse issues, but the distal radius 
similar to the distal tibia, the distal radius has three biomechanical columns. We have been fortunate as orthopedic surgeons to have witnessed a tremendous progress that has occurred in imaging. When I began my career as an orthopedic surgeon uh, in the late 1960s, all that we had available were plain x-rays and two plain tomography. And here I'm showing you an example from 1978, the images that we had available, an AP and lateral and two oblique projections. These are valid to this very day, but today we are able to obtain far more information. But what I do wish to bring to your attention that much of what we have taught and what we rely upon stems from the days when we only had plain x-rays to deal with. We didn't have a CT. We didn't have surface reconstruction. And we didn't have an MRI. The imaging available in the 1970s were just plain x-rays and tomography. And the progress which has occurred in imaging, you must keep in mind that the original classification of many fractures that we deal with is based on the conventional two-plane tomography and two-plane radiography. No coronal, no axial, and no sagittal reformation, no 3D surface reconstruction, and no MRI. The progress in imaging, which has occurred since 1973, is the advent of the CT with the three-plane reconstruction, sagittal, coronal, and axial. And the value of this is unbelievable as an aid and as a guide to the preoperative planning and fixation. I already emphasized for you the concept of the principal fracture plane, the position of joint depression, whether it is this pure articular depression, or whether it is a crush of the rim. And of course, we also obtain information on the comminution or fragmentation and the degree of depression of the articular surface. But I come back to preoperative planning and the importance of the axial reformation because it allows us, when we look on the left, yes, we recognize this is a fracture of the lateral tibial plateau. When we look very closely, we can recognize that this involves the posterior surface. And indeed, the axial cut shows us that this is a rim crush, a posterior rim crush. And all of us intuitively know the futility of trying to deal with such an injury through an anterior approach. It's impossible. So all this information is terribly important in preoperative planning, which truly is the key to surgical success. And the saying that failure to plan is a fail uh, is a planning a failure. 
the correct surgical approach is the key to success because it determines the positioning of the patient. It represents the correct access to the fracture. It will provide the best visualization of the articular surface. And it will make the correct stabilization possible. So that the correct choice of treatment really depends on the correct imaging. I am grateful for the collaboration that I have had uh, with a colleague of mine, Professor Maurizio Kfouri, uh, who is presently uh, in Columbia, Missouri, the United States, but originally from Brazil, who challenged me years ago on the question which he said, the tibia has two columns, a medial and a lateral column, and it has an articular surface, which is an anterior and posterior. But how do we divide what is in front and what is at the back? And he brought the concept of an equator. And this follows the functional approach, surgical approach to the proximal tibia. Namely, the equator runs from the anterior tubercle of the proximal fibula to the posterior aspect of the medial collateral ligament. This line is easily identifiable on an axial cut. And if the proximal tibia is completely crushed, we can certainly go to the opposite side in order to gain guidance on where is the equator, not the diameter, but the equator and not the diameter because the anterior half of the tibia is much larger than the posterior. So we can't speak of halves, the anterior aspect and the posterior aspect divided by the virtual equator defines what is in front and defines what is in the back. We are now beginning to look at the proximal tibia in three dimensions. Why is this important? My original classification didn't allow for placement of the split wedge fragment in three dimension. There was type two, type four, type five, but in the three dimension, we had no placement. But if we define, and I have stated that the key to the instability is the split wedge. So we, sorry, didn't mean to advance. So when we look at the split wedge, it is a three-dimensional structure. It has a rim, it has part of the metaphysis, and it has its exit. And we know that the split off wedge is the key to joint stability. So when you're looking at an axial cut, you say, this is the virtual equator, is the split wedge anterior or is the split wedge posterior? Because we know that the split wedge leads to 
loss of rim continuity and instability. And the plate, the buttress plate, is what we call the method of achieving containment. Containment is here a new concept which I bring and introduce to you. It is not the same as rim continuity. So when we now look at the implications of looking at a fracture in three dimensions, we say, yes, this is a fracture of the lateral plateau. It is a type two, that is the principal type. But the question now, is it anterior or is it posterior? This is a type six fracture. It has a fracture of the lateral plateau, anterior and posterior, and it has a fracture of the medial tibial plateau. So it will be a type five or a type six, medial, posterior, and lateral, anterior, and posterior. Having, and I will speak to you at the end today on this three-dimensional classification, but I am introducing this to you now because you're now beginning to see the progress that has occurred. And here is a clinical example of a type two, anterior and posterior. Example, sorry. You have an anterior wedge and you have a posterior wedge and both require surgical attention in order to achieve stability. So the importance of this is in preoperative planning because the plan to fail is to fail to plan is plan to fail. Preoperative planning diagnosis, the location and morphology goes to surgical approach patient positioning, the fracture anatomy and type of reconstruction. There are other related issues, which I will go over very quickly. The issue of bone grafting, we have recognized that a bone graft is simply a filler. In an articular fracture, it will unite without the bone graft. The bone graft has the function to fill the void and support the articular surface. The concept of rafting, I simply wish to bring to your attention the importance not to introduce metal in rafting too close to the articular surface, particularly if we are using angular stable plates because it stiffens the subchondral bone plate and will lead to articular fracture destruction rather than reconstruction. I also wish to bring to your attention soft tissue issues, namely the fact that a repair, that a collateral ligament disruption requires early surgical intervention to regain stability. We're dealing here with peripheral stability versus axial stability, which comes from the cruciate. We have also learned not to excise, but to repair the menisci and to deal with the cruciate ligament early only if there is a clear avulsion uh, from the metaphysis. And I also wish to remind you not to forget the lesions of the posterolateral corner, which for a long time have been forgotten. So when you are dealing with an articular 
fracture, it has certain requirements which must be met. And I know that this is extremely important because fractures have no respect for geography. They occur in areas that are under managed, under manned, and do not meet the prerequisites for treatment of an interarticular fracture. That is terribly important to recognize. We can't do everything that is necessary everywhere. So we must have the minimally requirements. Today, we must have sea arm. We must have full control of all intraoperative guides. And then, of course, we require rehabilitation. Articular cartilage requires motion. We must remember that immobilization will result in stiffness. Articular cartilage requires motion for nutrition and regeneration. And surgery requires immobilization. We must remember that the time to weight bearing, an important question. We must re remember that metaphysis unites very rapidly. The metaphysis is solid by six weeks, but we must wait for articular cartilage healing and regeneration before loading. So early motion is not early weight bearing. And in a complex intraarticular fracture, oftentimes we must wait at least 12 weeks before we can progress to weight bearing, first partial and then full, because of articular cartilage regeneration which requires an environment of low stress. So in summary, the timing of intervention is most important to prevent soft tissue complications. While we are waiting, we must immobilize the extremity provisionally, and this is where external fixation is of great importance. If you place an extremity in a cast or a splint, it will shorten. And this shortening is then extremely difficult to overcome. So the external fixator is a provisional form of fixation, important to maintain length and to some degree alignment. We do, we apply an external fixator and we then carry out the CT because as I have illustrated for you, in order to be able to judge the rim injury, we require a provisional degree of reduction. And then we must determine the type of rim discontinuity, whether it is a split wedge, or whether it is a crush. And these are essential features for the correct preoperative plan, where we plan to restore joint stability by restoring the continuity of the rim and joint congruity by restoring the reduction of the articular surface. Both are terribly important. The congruity is for the weight-bearing surface. But if you fail to restore joint stability, you have failed from the very first. So joint stability is of paramount importance than joint congruity. And remember, early function is essential to restore articular cartilage 
healing and regeneration. And remember that lock plating, angular stability is only a method of fixation. It is of great aid in periarticular and articular injuries. It's a great aid in minimally invasive surgery, but please remember it is not a biological principle, simple mechanics, and it no way changes the laws of nature governing bone union and articular cartilage regeneration. So this brings us to the end of the first lecture. If you will allow me now, I will simply manipulate here to get to the second lecture and you can stand up and stretch. I invite you to have a period of rest while I work here to bring the second lecture up. The second lecture is going to deal with the management, the history of management of tibial plateau fractures. Are you seeing my screen? Uh, it's still a blank screen. It's blank. Still, still a blank screen. So I think it takes some time to load up. Sorry. Still a blank screen. Uh, give me a moment. No problem. Are you able to see? No. Or is it still a blank screen? Still a blank screen. Okay. Just give me a moment. We'll try to. Maybe I'm sure and share again. Pardon me? Yes. And share and share again, sir. You see this? No, it's still blank. Oh no, it's, not, it's, come, on. it's come on, it's come on now. Pardon me? It's come on. Yeah. It has come on. Very good. Can you see this all right? Yep. Perfect. Yeah. The management of tibial float to Perfect. Can you Perfect. see it? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Very good. <clears throat> All right. The second talk, which I wish uh, to give you this morning, is the management of the tibial plateau fractures in the 1970s and the progress which has taken place. For some of you, this is new. For some of us, this is a journey uh, that we have taken. So I must take you back to the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, to the days when meeting rooms were filled with smoke and you could barely see through it. <laughs> 
everyone would be smoking the days of the diazo blue text slides some of you probably have no idea what i'm talking about to the early days of the round kodak carousel projectors and in europe the open lights trays which would easily turn over and spill everything even to the days where we began, where we used to manually advance two and a half inch glass slides. And to the days of conservative care and its outcomes. That was my beginning. That was the world when I began to practice as an orthopedic surgeon. So what did we have available is the diagnostic aids in the early 1970s. And I live in a big country, and so do you, much larger than my country. But the geographic reality is that there are areas that lack the equipment and lack the expertise and some of what I will be speaking about of the early 1970s is the reality in some areas that that is all that is available. So it is important to optimize everything that is available. What did we have in the early days? Well, we had ears, eyes, and hands. We must obtain a history from the patient. That gives us extremely important information. And we must carry out a physical examination. I, I, I cannot waste enough time to speak about the importance of this. An X-ray, a CT, an MRI, require a physical examination for correlationship. Imaging does not give everything. But the early imaging which we had available were plain x-rays, the two lateral, the AP, the lateral, and the two oblique projections. The tomography was available only in two planes. And we used to carry out an examination under anesthesia, stress views, which gave us a great deal of information. And we had arteriography and the mini laparotomy. And that is all that was available. When you looked at the literature that was guiding treatment, there was the volume from Watson Jones in English and Baylor in German. There was the Charnley book, a jewel of information on the close treatment of common fractures. We had Campbell's operative orthopedics used to this very day, but in 1963, it contained a page and a half on the principles of internal fixation because we didn't know anything. The AO came in the late 50s, early 60s, and the first publication of the AO was in 1965. It was the few new principles. Then came the addition of the AO manual, but that didn't appear till 1970, till I translated it from German into English. And I want to remind you that fracture classification was all based on the two plane concept of fractures. And the illustration of all fractures was all in two planes. 
The early operating room was filled with collection of implants and screws of different manufacturers, which don't fit, different metals. They didn't have specific indications. We in North America had no distractor, no specialized tools, no pointed clamps, forceps. All this didn't become available till the plastic pelvic set appeared. We didn't have cannulated screws. We really had very little. We had no bone substitutes available. There was no bone bank. There was no such a thing as allograft. Fracture tables were mostly for fractured hips, as illustrated here. There were no translucent tables available. All this sounds primitive to you, but that was the reality. And it is the reality in some parts of the world. We only had plain x-rays. We only had two plane tomography. Arteriography had to be done in the angiography suite of the X-ray department, or we could attempt angiography in the operating room ourselves. There was no Doppler ultrasound. There was no CT. There was no angiography, only venography. There was no CT, no three surface reformation. There was no MRI. There was no intraoperative fluoroscopy. We had no C arms. We had no CTs. We had no intraoperative guidance. And intraoperative x rays meant that they, the technician took the x ray. He would then disappear for about five minutes, and then he reappeared with a dripping wet x-ray and would put it up in the view box. Let's look at surgical education. What did we have available? In North America, educational university was university-based but there were no curriculums available. Few centers had courses in surgery, but none orthopedics. North America was somewhat advanced in surgical education, largely because of the Second World War. In Europe, in the early 70s, there was no organized education it was all institution based. And surgical education was based on the mentor principle. There were no principles guiding. It was my way of doing things. There was no standardized body of knowledge or an agreed curriculum. And qualifications, of course, varied widely. We had no computers. We had no databases. We had no internet. We had no fax. We had no iPhone. We had no iPad. And we had no Professor Google. Cameras, well, when we took a picture of something, it took a few days for it to be developed. The making of slides was extremely difficult. It had to be typed, it had to be photographed, it had to be developed, and it had to be mounted. And transfer of images. I am able in my lecture today to show you image after image after image. In my days, when I began surgery, there was no way of transferring images. And when it came to research, we had extremely primitive databases that we created ourselves on large pieces of paper which we then glued together and put it on the floor 
in order to be able to see it all together. We had no agreed classification systems to make studies possible. Findings were based on the concepts of a particular author. There was no agreement. There was no such thing as evidence-based medicine. There was no such thing as decision-making. These were concepts that yet had to be invented. We had no prospective documentation. Everything was based on retrospective studies by diagnosis. And there was a tremendous loss of cases for study. We didn't have a concept of a collaborative approach. I published my classification in 1974. It was based on a retrospective analysis of cases treated in the Toronto hospitals over a period of four years. It was based on the chart review and x-ray. It was an attempt to form a database and lumps were liked with lump with I, at least I lumped likes with likes. And then I examined what I had and attempted to reach valid conclusions. In those days, we had no concept of interpersonal and intrapersonal agreement and no principles guiding any classification. Most classifications simply followed the author's concepts. The classification which I published 1974 was based on the patient's age in an ascending order based on the morphology or the complexity of the morphology also in an ascending order based on bone quality based on the amount of energy involved to some degree these were visionary and for me the most important concept was joint stability and indications for surgery, in my view, were based on instability, not the amount of joint depression. In 1960 to 1980, the first 20 years, these were the principles of intra-articular fracture care, immediate surgery, the achievement of congruity of the joint surface, the prevention of axial overload, the prevention loss of articular reduction, and early mobilization. Let us look at this a little closer. Preoperative planning, what did we have? Well, this, it was based on two plane images and two plane tomography, and planning was all in two dimension. And the patient positioning was always supine on the operating table. I'm speaking of days before patient intubation. You could not ventilate the patient who was prone on the operating table. There was pressure on the chest, impossible. So patients, by virtue of anesthetic, were positioned supine. And we didn't have such a thing as a translucent table. And I have already discussed with you the plain imaging. I want to stress this is available to this very day, namely an EUA and a stress X-ray. You don't have a CT to provide you invaluable information. You can see from this very simple study that you have a rupture of the collateral ligament, that you have a rupture of the cruciate ligaments, and that you have a major depression of an intraarticular surface. So there were ways of gaining information, information which today we take very much for granted. In two-dimensional imaging, 
the classification systems were in two dimension. We used to speak that in order to become an orthopedic surgeon, you had to have the ability to think in three dimensions. Why was this so important? It was important because we were taking information in two dimension and in our mind, in our imagination, we had to visualize the third dimension because it was only at the time of surgery they could actually see the three-dimensional appreciation of a fracture. And at that point, it is too late to make changes because you have already made the approach. Now let's look at the surgical approaches. In 1970, there was the left, on the left, the peripatellar incision. There was the hockey stick or the L-shaped incision. And the AO proposed the triradiate, which we used to call the Mercedes-Benz incision because it looks like the Mercedes-Benz star, based on three 120 degree flaps. Everything from in front. Then came progress. We abandoned the Mercedes star incision because we recognized that it led to many soft tissue complications. So we had the parapatellar incision and then came the midline incision. Remember, we are still dealing with a surgical approach only from in front. And it was the comprehensive surgical approach, which I actually published, which was the Z-shaped division of the infrapatellar tendon, which you then repaired and protected with a tension band. Remember, you now have a patient supine on the operating table, and you have to get to the back of the joint. Everything was from in front. We didn't have a posteromedial or a posterolateral approach, and we never went to the back of the knee. That was spoken of as the tiger country. There were big nerves, big vessels. Well, how did we do? Difficult to imagine any degree of success. This x-ray is of an Olympic skier who landed on an extensive, extended knee at 120 kilometers an hour. And this is what the joint looked like. It looks like a bloody mess. You can't see anything on the left. On the right, you are beginning to see, this is the comprehensive anterior approach. And you see the provisional X-ray and then the definitive fixation. CPM was the rage of the day, continuous passive motion. And this was the result with the very primitive AIDS, full reconstruction of the joint, full extension, full flexion, and this skier returned to skiing, but not at the Olympic level. Well, we had many successes, but what were the errors of the first 20 years? I've already touched upon this, the indiscriminate early surgery on all articular fractures led to a very high incidence of soft tissue complications. We had such nonsense in the literature as what was called the dead bone sandwich, namely bone between two plates. All the focus was on the bone. 
No one spoke about the soft tissue envelope. We simply failed to recognize the implications of trauma as a principal soft tissue lesion. And indiscriminate early surgery on all articular fractures, as you can well imagine, led to a large collection of disasters. What did we learn? Well, we learned to differentiate between low and high energy fractures. We learned, and I'm going to use, since we're speaking about the proximal tibia, I will speak about my classification, namely type one, two, and three are fractures, intra-articular fractures. Type four, five, and six are fracture dislocations, low energy, and high energy. Already at the very beginning, I was able to recognize the difference. Why is this important? Well, types one, two, and three, as I have already said, can go to early surgery. But the four, five, and six, the fracture dislocations, these are injuries where you have major soft tissue trauma. It is the soft tissue trauma which will guide the timing and the method of definitive treatment. Sometimes the soft tissue trauma is so severe that it threatens the survival of the limb. Joint stability is the issue. The concept of when to operate. The only emergencies that we recognize as valid are the open fractures, those with a compartment syndrome, those which have a vascular or neurological complication. The rest, provisional reduction, and you wait. We had major progress in imaging. And I want to highlight that from two imaging, we went to three-dimensional representation, axial, sagittal, and coronal. We also had the ability of three-dimensional surface reconstruction. And the axial cut provided us with information, which I have already highlighted, the principal fracture plane. The position, correct position of the buttress plate parallel to the principal fracture plane. I highlighted for you already the concept of split wedge or compression, axial impaction of the rim, both representing split wedge and instability. I'm very much indebted to Professor Quarry, who posed the question and said, Joe, we all recognize your classification, but wouldn't it be nice if we had some means of communicating whether the injury was to the anterior or posterior aspect of the tibial plateau? And this led uh, to a CT study of well over 100 fractures, first to validate the classification, and then information from this study led to the anatomic study of the proximal tibia with the concept of the virtual equator, which I've already highlighted for you, and the ensuing four quadrants defining the limits of exposure. I have already highlighted for you the concept of the equator and 
the progress in our concept that it wasn't anatomic reduction. It came, stability came because we were attempting anatomic reduction. But I wish to leave with you principles. And the principle is you must achieve joint stability, joint congruity, and a straight limb. Now the issue, and I've already touched upon, namely the question, what is it that defines joint stability? And at the sake really of repeating myself, it is the discontinuity of the rim. It is the loss of rim continuity that defines joint stability, as well, of course, as the metaphyseal deformity. And in an intraarticular fracture, what defines joint stability? Well, ligamentous and capsular disruptions. And when we come to the fracture itself, I've already highlighted for you that there are differences in fractures, articular impaction, rim crush, and rim split wedge. And I've already mentioned the concept of the stability, the containment and continuity, and how to localize in space the fracture and I will speak about this in detail. But here I'm highlighting for you the progress that took place as we marched and presented our new contributions, namely the wedge fracture, the rim lesion is the key to joint stability. And the proposal to extend the classification in three dimension. All this, gentlemen, allows us today to speak with one language and carry out multi-center studies and research because we can call an apple an apple and an apple an orange, but we won't mix them. And this facilitates the planning and execution to achieving a stable joint, number one, congruous reticular surface, number two, and a straight limb, number three, which greatly achieves better outcomes. You had the dimps, glimpse of where I began we refer today as the dark ages of tibial plateau surgery. I've highlighted for you the struggles. We were able to follow the steps which we took to achieve today's level of expertise. And today we have a, a wealth of information and truly ability to deal rationally with very difficult, challenging surgical issues. This ends the second lecture, and I will exit here. And I invite you once again to stand up and stretch while I move here to the third presentation. I'm moving from one to the other, and at the very end, we will definitely have an opportunity for questions and answers. But I'm going to give you the three presentations first, and
Yeah, sorry. Are you able to see it? Are you seeing it? Yes. Yes. Yes, very yeah. good. Then we can go ahead. All right. Now I, I want to finish by speaking to you on the extension of the Shasker tibial plateau classification and three dimensions. I have already alluded to this twice, but I want to speak about the details. I want to highlight for you once again, the 1974 tibial plateau fracture classification based on the two dimensional representation of fracture patterns. Two dimension, gentlemen. It was organized according to their essence the essence, the concept of what is it actually? Well, it's the age of the patient, the bone quality, the morphologic architecture of the fracture and the energy involved. And types one, two, and three fractures, types four, five, and six fracture dislocations and the indications for surgery Already early on, I recognized the importance of joint stability and not the degree of joint depression, impaction, and so on. Stability. I already mentioned and will not belabor the point of what was available in 1974 and the purpose of the study, which we undertook was to revisit the classification four decades after its description. And I carried out the major study in conjunction with Professor Khoury. We examined each fracture type in the light of information made available by the CT scan which today comprises a standard tool and an essential tool in articular fracture care. Further aim was to incorporate this new information and now present the classification in three dimension. Now, we learned a tremendous amount from the CT study, but the key issue still, which we required in order to recognize, namely the concept of the split wedge or the articular rim impaction as the key to joint stability. And We were now working at a time when there was tremendous emphasis placed on the coronal plane, which previously was not available. Uh, we were now beginning to speak of the tibial plateau having three columns as proposed by Luo Confeng from Shanghai a concept with which I do not agree. 
but I am simply reviewing for you the history and the information as it evolved. Chang was the first to propose the four quadrants, which was gaining greater clarity. And Maurizio Curie really brought the definition for us virtually with the virtual equator, not diameter, equator of what is in front and what is to the back and how to divide this from the patellar tendon to the foot plate of the po posterior cruciate. We now have the definition of four quadrants and each quadrant defines a different surgical approach. And let me highlight for you again, the forces responsible for articular fractures, shear and compression, not torsion. I have already highlighted for you in detail, but these were all new concepts, namely of what is the key element to joint stability, namely the split wedge, the loss of rim continuity. And successful surgery in dealing with intra-articular fractures demands restoration of joint stability by reconstruction of the rim lesion, which is either a split wedge or a rim impaction. So the key to the 3D classification was the identification of the lesion responsible for joint instability. The concept of the equator, the concept of the split wedge, and the concept of what is containment, namely the buttress plate containing the split wedge and restoring stability. Now, here we have a comminuted fracture of the lateral tibial plateau. Today, we're able to look at this critically and say, yes, we have one split wedge, which is anterior, and we have a second split wedge, which is posterior. Now, how are we going to communicate this to you without an image? Well, it's a type two fracture of the lateral tibial plateau. But now I am denoting for you the two key elements here responsible for instability. Namely, it's a type two anterior and a type two posterior. So it's at a type two AP. So what I'm writing to you or speaking to you on the telephone and I tell you I have a type 2 AP, you immediately visualize, ah, he's talking about a fracture of the lateral tibial plateau. It has a split wedge anteriorly and a split wedge posteriorly. And now I'm going to speak to you about, oh, I have a type 5. Oh, what do you mean? Well, it's a type five, remember, bicondylar fracture with continuity of the metaphysis. I have a type five medial posterior and on the lateral side, anterior and posterior. So it's at the type five medial posterior lateral, anterior, and posterior. So I'm able to, for you, in a very precise way of denoting, in writing, what we are dealing with. 
Here you have an example of a clinical type two anterior, a classic split wedge, which is anterior, as you can see, dealt with surgically, a very simple, straightforward example. But here you have a type three. Well, in a type three, you can denote that this is a type three posterior or a type three anterior. That is of importance because you like to reduce these by introducing a curved punch and you need to know whether to go anteriorly or posteriorly. So the three dimension in surgery is essential. Now you have a clinical example of a type two. Yes, it's a split wedge type two, undoubtedly. But look, it has lateral tibial plateau anterior, but it also has a posterior split wedge. If you reduce only the anterior and not the posterior, you have an unstable knee joint. So this is a type two anterior and posterior, and it was dealt with by a primary posterior approach and an excellent clinical outcome. So what have I been trying to accomplish? Well, what we're trying to avoid is this example, which happened in the 1980s. This was a 48 year old federal cabinet minister who had this fracture treated in traction on a CPM because the surgeon heard that continuous passive motion led to a good outcome. Remember, we've been dealing with intra-articular injuries. This is his x-ray at six months. And this is what his leg looked like. And I won't belabor that this was not a functional extremity. This was dealt with surgically, but unfortunately, not properly. Why? Because the surgeon left a large posterior split wedge fragment unreduced, not part of the fixation. The result was an unstable, stiff, painful knee. It required an intra-articular osteotomy to reduce the split wedge and restore joint stability. Yes, I'm showing you a good clinical outcome of a difficult surgical procedure, but we are trying to avoid these problems. So what have I presented for you? new significance of anatomical landmarks of the proximal tibia. I've spoken to you about the definition of the virtual equator and the division of the proximal tibia into four quadrants. I have mentioned to you the principal fracture plane as a new concept. I have emphasized the importance of recognizing a split wedge and the fact that the rim impaction is a split wedge and that the instability of a joint is the loss of rim continuity. And you need to provide continuity of the rim and containment of the split wedge in order to restore function. So, Remember, the outcome of intra-articular fractures depends on joint stability, joint congruity, 
and return of the normal axis of the extremity. I have emphasized the th three-dimensional concept, the three-dimensional imaging, and remember that achieving joint stability and congruity depends on the exact identification and, three dimension, and a three-dimensional localization of the morphological issues, such as the principal flexure plane, etc. And please remember, proper preoperative planning will ensure the proper patient positioning, the proper surgical approach. It will make it possible to achieve reduction and stable fixation and then the internal fixation to maintain what you have achieved. These are all complex prerequisites necessary to achieve the best outcome when dealing with complex intraarticular injuries. There is a great deal of progress which we have made. There's a great deal of information but this is all available today. I think we're living, we're fortunate to be living in an era where we have the ability to deal successfully with very complex surgical issues with all the aids which the last 50, 60 years have produced and made possible. It's not available to every part of the country. It's not available to every surgeon. But we must learn to work in unison together, helping one another and helping the surgeon who is working in a primitive area to know exactly what he should do and when he should refer the patient to centers that have the equipment, that have the ability to decrease really the lifelong invalidity of a serious major intraarticular fracture. Gentlemen, intraarticular fractures have been my lifelong passion. I thank you for the opportunity uh, to make these presentations and speak to you. We have made tremendous progress and it's a privilege to be able to share it with you. Zoom has been a tremendous adjunct in surgical education. It's marvelous to have the opportunity to speak to all of you on this intercontinental surgical journey. I thank you again for the opportunity. This ends my formal presentations and I will stay online to deal with any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaska. That was just wonderful. You on words. I mean, so much, so much, and so much of information to take back. Uh, this is a tsunami of information. Thank you. And that's a lifelong journey that you have shared with us. Thank you for all the information and knowledge that you have shared with us. There has been one question on, the, on a panel here. Is, uh, how important do you feel MRI in this evolving uh, article injuries, MRI as a diagnostic tool? I did not dwell at length. I thank you very much for this very important question. Today we feel, and we are dealing now with complex injuries, that an MRI is essential. Uh, it allows us to identify the characteristics of the soft tissue components 
and the soft tissue components allow us to deduce the mechanism of injury and uh, the mechanism of injury leads us then to a three-dimensional concept and to the lesions which needs to be addressed in order to restore joint stability and early function. It's terribly important. I know you will say, well, look, some centers have made progress and have a CT. Well, not every center has everything. Not every fracture requires everything. But when you have a concept, when you have a co complicated articular fracture, it's only when you address every part of the fracture that you will be able to ensure full return of function. So an MRI today comprises an essential element. So just taking thank, that- Thank you very much for the question. Just taking that forward a bit, uh, the soft tissue injuries, uh, do you uh, suggest that they should be dealt at the same time that you doing the bony injuries or do you sort of stage them out? I'm just taking a combination, let's say there is a anticruciate kind of or a prostocruciate lesion or a postulateral corner injury. Would you deal with them at the same time while you're doing the bony work or would you stage it out? I will say, first of all, if we are dealing with a complex injury like that, it will not be surgery on day one or day two. The patient will spend a minimum of a week in an external fixator frame, waiting for the severity of the soft tissue to subside. At the same time, having the limb now in fixed traction, because an external fixator is really a fixed method of traction, it will allow us to plan carefully what are the, the elements of this injury. Anterior cruciate or posterior cruciate reconstruction is almost always delayed. That is axial stability versus peripheral stability. Peripheral stability is essential. You can't leave a collateral ligament torn because you will have instability, lateral collateral ligament torn. These ligaments have to be reconstructed early at the time that the bone is being dealt with the posterolateral corner. But cruciates the central axial stability, unless you have a major large piece of bone evulsed, they are left for a secondary reconstruction in the future if necessary. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I ask the question, Professor? Of course, please. So I have, uh, I'm Dr. Chetan Pradhan from uh, Pune. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation and deserves a standing ovation from uh, everyone who's listening. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. I have uh, two questions. One is uh, in this new system of classification, where do the uh, zero column fractures fit in, which means the eminence fractures or ACL and PCL avulsion uh, injuries, where do they fit into this classification? That's uh, question number one. The, and the eminence is... I want to ask you... If... Yes, sir. Uh, well, let me answer. I am... The classification deals with fractures of the tibial plateau and with the articular aspects, the eminence, the anterior spine avulsion, I'm sure you're thinking of, uh, that is not part of the classification. 
Okay. And uh, the second question was, uh, sometimes it takes longer time for the soft tissues to settle down in a pick setup. So suppose it's going to take, say, a couple of weeks with the fixator on C2, then uh, would you immediately, at the end of two weeks, convert it to internal fixation or would you remove and give a fixator free period before you can do any bony reconstruction? Well, the longer, let, let me emphasize, the importance of the external fixator is twofold. So. It allows the healing of soft tissue but it also maintains length. It's yes. terribly important to regain length when you apply the external fixator, because to try and reconstruct a shortened extremity at three weeks is almost a guaranteed failure. You, you can't regain length. So, you know, we hate to say we use an external fixator. It's an essential part because it will maintain length. Then at three weeks, the situation is still not easy because now the metaphyseal fragments have stuck together. You have to break them apart. Yes, but you will be able to put them under the femur. When the leg has shortened, it doesn't want to fit. There's no room for it. Right. So th there is no doubt. The longer you have to wait, the less optimal the outcome. But it is far, far better to have a patient whose knee is not perfect, but his, whose soft tissue envelope has survived than the patient who has a pretty looking x-ray and a horrible breakdown necrotic wound you know what's going to end up with a better outcome yes but if i if i have to wait for a long time with a fixer uh, how safe is it to convert it to internal fixation immediately in the same sitting or should a fixer of free period be given in between well, that depends, of course, if the external fixator, well, look, first of all, the, ex the external fixator is applied in such a way that it is well removed from the fracture. Right. So with that in mind, when you're applying the external fixator, it's femur to tibia, spanning the spanning knee the joint. Knee. Right. Span the knee. Yes. Don't be anywhere near the knee. Right. Because you don't want to have pinholes that are draining pus when you need to make an incision. Yes. And with proper pin care, they will survive easily three to four weeks. Okay. But if, if your shan screws are well removed then you can certainly uh, deal with it surgically. They won't be in the in the field. Can I ask a question? Shastra? Another question, if I may? Yes, sir. Um, when we talk about articular reduction on the table, and so I've been asking myself also, we are so accurate about the lateral side. We open it out, we are very, very, we try to get it absolutely perfect. For the medial side, we rely more of an indirect, which I can understand because the approach isn't easy. So are we moving towards looking at the medial side a bit more closely? Because now we have identified, uh, let's say, a type 5 MAP and a LA. There we are sort of looking more at the LA side, getting an absolute reduction, absolute, you know, the particular blocks together. But the MAP side, we are just doing like a metaphysical reconstruction. Why is this step model treatment towards the medial side? And do we, are you thinking ahead, making some changes in our plan? Well, I think the medial, well, you have to ask yourself, which is the principal fracture? Is it on the medial side or is it on the lateral side? 
Uh, the type six, going just medially and not laterally, or going just laterally and not medially, you might as well not go, period. Because both sides are equally important. And, yeah, I agree on that. So, but then the articular surface is something we are so perfect on the lateral side. The medial side, we rely more on the metaphysical reduction, getting us an articular reduction. Well, so, look, if you have a split wedge yeah. without articular comminution, and I'm talking about reality, the medial side is much stronger than the lateral side. It is much less common to get articular surface comminution on the medial side. But it's having said that, let me warn you of one thing. When the fracture crosses the intercondylar eminence, this is still a, a subtype. Oftentimes fragments get trapped in the fracture line. And if you see that there is a fragment trapped in a fracture line, you will not achieve a reduction by just observing that the metaphysis appears reduced because it won't be able to reduce. So you, you, you have to remove the fragment between the, the main fragment and the split wedge in order to make room for the reduction. So I, I don't know whether I have answered it yeah, completely yes, to your satisfaction. Absolutely. That's what I was looking at because I've had this problem with the little fragment was jammed in and we were so I was so stuck on doing the metaphysical reduction. I was missing that little bits of fragment which was jamming the articular surface apart. I have it a couple of times. So. Well, when you uh, look carefully at, yeah. at the axial cut, yeah, and you see that there is a fragment, mm -hmm. this fragment has to be removed first, and it's usually removed through an anterolateral separate approach. Mm -hmm because that is the plane of the fracture. It goes from posterior medial to anterolateral. So you have to make the anterolateral approach first, remove the fragment, and then go posterior medially. Okay. Uh, Oftentimes, the two incisions are made at the same time. Here, the patient is supine, and you have access to the posterior medial tibia and to the anterolateral tibia. Okay, gentlemen, you have a meeting to continue. Thank you. I think we will stop at this point and allow me to thank you once again. It's been a real privilege and a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are also very grateful to you uh, we just summarize whole things by one, two minutes. We have our uh, West Bengal Orthopedics Association uh, Secretary, Dr. Partho Sarathi Sarkar. So I request Dr. Sarkar, please uh, take over the mic and we will conclude. And we have also Dr. Supra Chatterjee, our Ortho Club Secretary. Please, please uh, sum up with your words. Thank you, uh, Obhijit, Dr. Obhijit Bandhavadai. It is really, I am fortunate to welcome Professor Joe Sachkar, the living legend, on behalf of West Bengal Orthopedic Association and for your gracious presence. And thank you, Howard Orthopedic Club, for organizing this program. And Dr. thank you, Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee and Dr. Chetan Pradhan for wonderful moderation of the program. And thank you all participants for making this academic feast a remember one. Thank you all. Now, Dr. Obhijit Bandhavadai, please you. really organized this program wonderfully. Thank you, Obhijit. And now, Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee, Dr. Supra Chatterjee, please, we will summarize. Yeah. Unmute. You unmute. Yeah. Okay. 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 It was great to learn from the master.
uh, we hope that uh, it has been uh, such a uh, privilege to hear from you so we hope in future you will also be there with us to conduct another similar course thank you so much sir thank you i i i uh, thank you dr rajiv chatterjee and thank dr you. chetan prodhan and also again thank you professor sachkar for your precious time with us thank you and also and also we must thank our um, uh, sponsor uh, format yeah. yeah thank you thank you abhijit thank you everyone for this opportunity thank you thank you it's wonderful thank you oh, rajiv thank you all thank you good night good night and good morning to professor sachkar good afternoon to him Yeah. Have a great day. Have a great, have a great day. Goodbye, have gentlemen. It was a pleasure. Yes. Thank you.